So, I bought a new car, or at least new to me, because it's far from factory fresh to say the least. It all started when I had to bring the Saab in for a yearly MOT checkup. And there, in a dusty corner, I saw this Mazda MX-5, or Miata as it's known stateside. Under some carpet on deflated tires and obviously in need of some love, after not having been on the road for over one and a half years. So after some inspection, I bought it, took it home and now here we are. In this video I'll fix a ton of smaller things which together bring this car to a state where comfort, looks and drivability are all okay-ish. It won't be perfect, not anywhere near, uh, but it will serve as a proper base for any future project. Now before we get started, this car is new to me. Uh, and I'm fairly inexperienced working on cars, so I learned a lot from other YouTubers. So it seems only fair to defer to them whenever they have a better how-to video available. So uh, whenever you see one of these in the screen, uh, know that in the description you'll find a link to one of those better videos with a proper how-to. So let's see what we have and get started. Obviously it's dirty and dusty, and the bonnet's got quite a few marks. The interior is actually in decent shape with a small cut in the driver's side door panel and chairs that look super tired, but otherwise I'm happy. The soft top is definitely of the cheaper variety, with a plastic rear window instead of heated glass. And as you can see it's not mounted to the car in the back, but we'll fix that later. Then let's check out the driver's side footwell, where decades worth of nastiness buried itself in the carpet. And the storage in the console, which is equally disgusting. Anyway, let's pop the bonnet and see the almighty 1.6 liter four-cylinder beast generating an admittedly modest 110 horsepower. I actually think the engine bay still looks quite alright. It's fairly clean, though the huge amount of homemade wiring protection using old electrical tape is slightly worrying. Now we'll get back to the engine soon enough, but first let's do some basic cleaning so I don't die of some exotic disease when I touch the thing.
So, that cleaned up nicely. I plan on improving the outside further by polishing not too long from now, but the interior already looks heaps better. As I'm waiting for the needed parts to arrive anyway, let's spend some time making small improvements to the interior. And oof, that is super nasty. By the way, I did try to clean the floor mats as well. Doing so was a lot of fun, and in the end the mats were quite clean. Unfortunately, they are also old and worn out, so I ordered new ones anyway. As the seats were out anyway, I decided to do a foamectomy, which basically means you cut part of its foam to create a deeper seating position, thereby creating more space. I didn't film this, but if you want to know more about this, I linked a great explainer video by Flying Miata in the description. Suffice to say that the extra cabin space was welcome. Now, a first and important point to fix are the soft top latches, which won't stay closed due to the mechanism being worn out. So, let's 3D print some new latch parts. To replace these, of course, we first need to remove the entire latch mechanism from the soft top. Three screws hold it in place, and they're easily undone. Next, we'll take the mechanism inside, where we remove the E-clip holding the rod in its place. Then, pull the rod out using pliers. Now, the catch can be removed from the mechanism and replaced with a new one. Reseating the spring and rod is tedious work. I found that it's possible to use a plier in such a way that you both push the rod in its place and exert force on the rod end to push it in. After some wiggling, add the E-clip and it's done. Now we can return the mechanism to its rightful place. Now, I've seen many videos where people regain the locking function by tapping a small hole in which they add a screw, and I've seen a beautiful looking kit from Flying Miata. But I happen to have a 3D printer, so this works for me. I linked an alternative fix using the screw in the description. Now, this part is done. When reinstalling the mechanism, however, I noticed the protective end caps are missing. These end caps prevent the latch and catch from damaging each other. So again, 3D print to the rescue. Now, let's install the cap. Because the cap obviously adds some mass around the latch pin, we need to recalibrate the latch length a little bit. To do this, pop off the plastic cover, turn the mechanism by hand or with a 10mm spanner and reseat the plastic cover. And again, a snug fit. On to the next job. Now, I'm actually quite tall, 6 foot 4, so I need all the space I can get. A small but helpful fix is removing the sun visors, which are basically blocking my view of the outside world anyway. So, let's fire up the 3D printer again and print replacement plates. Installing them is easy. On the driver side, I printed a GoPro mount, because why not? Links to the files can be found in the description. Then, the alarm button is missing. It's actually residing inside the dashboard, and it's surprisingly hard to get a hold of through the hole. I feel like I'm performing pinhole surgery and I'm nowhere near flexible to pull that off. So let's go the blunt method and remove the radio, which I want to replace anyway. The easiest way I've found to do this is remove the blanking plate as well as the side trim. This exposes the holes on the side through which you can undo the latching mechanism. And the hole left after removing the blanking plate provides you with the grip you need to remove the radio. Then push a thin screwdriver in the second hole from the bottom and pull out that side of the radio. Repeat on the other side and voila! With the radio removed it's easy to grab the alarm button and a quick and disappointing check shows that the problem is that the plastic latch holding the button to the surrounding trim broke off. Now I glued it back together as best as I could. It seems to hold well so it's back and the hazard lights are back in working order. And by now the first few packages with new parts started arriving and among the very first of them is a brand new shift knob. Switching it is super easy, it just screws on. These small changes make such a big difference. Now that the radio is out, let's replace it with a new one. Because the standard radio is actually a fair bit larger than standard 2DIN, I 3D printed the spacer on the bottom that props up the cage about 6.5mm. The cage is then fixated into position by depressing the tabs. By using a connector that goes from the proprietary master plug to a standard ISO plug, it's super easy to install. But I went a bit further. Even though it's not strictly necessary, I chose to solder the two wiring looms together, thereby getting rid of the middle connectors. Now the radio can be pushed into position. Even though bolts or other methods of installing would be best, friction alone is enough to hold it in place. 
And yes, it's easy to steal this way. But if someone has access to the inside of my car, the radio is the least of my worries. By the way, the radio was as close to a free upgrade as I could get. It's the radio that used to be in my Saab, before I bought one with a larger screen. It fits the master beautifully, not in the least because I made a simple Miata themed wallpaper to make it blend in. And the amazing thing is now that I replaced the radio, the antenna suddenly started working again. And it's huge. It actually looks like an RC car when the antenna is fully out. It looks nice. Now that we're working on electrical stuff, let's address this obvious issue, the airbag light. Now, this is a Mark 2.5 European car. This means that rather than a passenger side airbag switch, there's a weight sensor in the passenger chair that dictates whether or not that airbag goes off in an accident. Now, 20 plus years of usage haven't done that sensor any favors. While it's surprisingly hard to find the airbag blink codes for this specific configuration, I was able to find that the sensor is likely malfunctioning. So I bought this, an airbag sensor bypass box. And of course, before we do anything, we need to disconnect the battery, but installing this should mean that the passenger side airbag always goes off in an accident, regardless of occupancy status. This seems like the safest of the two bypass options, rather than disabling the airbag entirely. So let's install and wrap it in a small plastic bag. I think I will end up relocating the entire thing to a different place anyway, but for now it's protected. And a quick test shows that indeed the light is now gone. Happy days. Whether or not the airbag will actually go off is surprisingly difficult to test without crashing the car, so let's just trust that it works. Then the doors. The door sills are off at the moment, which gives me the much needed opportunity to clean the surface area a bit. I then reinstall the plastic door sills. The clip holding the aluminium door sill plates to the plastic door sill are all broken, so the plate is loose. So, in a move that might anger those who prefer non-crappy solutions, I used glue to remount the sill plates. Sorry, it looks a lot better already though. Then the door bushings. Apparently the existing rubber ones are bad, because they allow for the door to flex somewhat. I have no idea if this is true, but I couldn't resist ordering new bushings, so let's get them installed. Removing them is easy. When installing the new ones, make sure to leave some play and smash the doors a few times to get them properly seated before tightening the bolts. It is here that I must apologize to my neighbors. I kind of forgot the time and by now it was almost midnight. So perhaps smacking the door 10 times in a row wasn't the most neighborly thing to do. But hey, new bushings are installed. Then, before we go to the big job of properly mounting the soft top, let's address this loose window trim. There are a couple of clips that hold the trim in its place and it's clear that one of those clips isn't mounted properly. So let's fish it out using a small screwdriver, reattach it and properly put the trim back in its rightful place. Good as new, sort of. Now for the soft top. As you can see, it's nowhere near mounted properly. The studs are exposed, the roof is flappy and it looks like someone forgot to install some parts. Now, working on the soft top is a lot easier when you remove the passenger chair again. After doing that, situate yourself facing backwards and get to work. And a quick first check shows that indeed parts are missing. There should be a large metal bracket here, but instead the roof and the rain rail are connected using a couple of misplaced nuts, which for some reason are installed the wrong way around, with the collar facing me. Fun times ahead. Now, let's first remove those wrongly installed nuts. And also the partial shelf carpet, which is held in by two large bolts in the corners right under the soft top mechanism. Normally there are a lot of push pins holding in the carpet, both in the back against the now missing metal rail, as well as in the front where the carpet bends down towards the chairs. Anyway, let's remove the carpet to reveal a very rusty cover. Even though it's normally covered by the carpet, of course now that I saw it, it cannot be unseen, so off it goes for repainting. I later took off the other cover, more towards the rear of the car too. Of course I also cleaned up the mating surface. The paint I bought can be used to cover up rust without sanding, but I think a bit of wire wheel action is worth it. I underestimated though how quickly the flying rust particles feel like an unhealthy workplace, so I moved it outside and finished it there. Now, the mating surface has a gasket-like foam that's obviously gone now, but I'll replace it later. For now, let's focus on getting a few good coats of paint and letting it dry. In the meantime, let's make sure that any water that does enter the rain rail can exit the car properly. 
for this purpose the Miata has two drain holes, one on either side, right behind the doors. They should be reachable with a properly mounted top as well, but the current state of it being loosely installed makes it a bit easier. I used a fish tape or an electrician's snake and pushed it through the clock drain holes on both sides until I saw it appear under the car, taking a fair amount of debris with it. And that's it, both drain holes are now open. Now back to the soft top. I tried to postpone it as long as possible because to be frank installing the metal rail sucks. The top being a fairly newish plasticky one has almost no give and neither of course does the metal bar. So it takes a lot of force to get it situated and even more force to get it situated in such a way that enough of the bolt is exposed to allow a nut to screw on. I'm not going to sugarcoat this, this was by far the most infuriating part of the entire video. And as much as editing it makes it seem sort of smooth, I had to remove and reseat the rail more than once. Of course it might be because I'm an idiot, which I am, but it's tedious work. Anyway, after the middle rail got done, both side rails can also be installed. There's a bolt pattern that helps, which is like this. Following this pattern will make your life easier as it sort of bends the middle rail in, thereby creating the necessary space for the side rails. Now, this job is finally done and for the first time in a while the soft top is installed in what I think is the proper way. So, time to get those freshly painted parts mounted again, but not before I reapply a gasket of some sorts. It's actually just a rubber door seal, like the one you would use to avoid drafts in your house, but I thought it would work well enough here. And a couple of screws later, and the covers are back. Looking much better. Now, time to reinstall the carpet on the parcel shelf. The two large bolts on the side go first. Don't forget the large plastic washers. Then the push pins, again, both holding the carpet to the metal rail, as well as mounting it to the area behind the seats. I don't have enough pins for all mounting holes, but it's good enough. And yes, by now the carpet is back to dirtiness, but I'll fix that later. For now, this job is done and I can finally move on to the next one, which is improving the lighting of this car. Now, at the moment the light is uneven with color differences between left and right, and it's not very bright. So, I'm replacing both the high and dip beams with some brand new Osram Nightbreakers. Replacing the lamp is super easy, just twist the mount and pull it out. For my car though, it's complicated by the fact that one of the two lights doesn't have the proper connector. It looks iffy, and it is. I'll install it anyway, but I'll go looking for some actual connectors to replace these makeshift ones. Anyway, a quick twist reseats the lights, and they are as bright as they can be. A nice improvement. Then the side indicators. They're a bit on the yellowed side, so I'm replacing them with brand new LED ones. By reusing the old rubber seal, as well as the light adapter inside the old fixture, installing is easy. A small improvement that makes the car look 1% more modern. Now, before we open the hood, let's replace the wiper blades, because the old ones are, well, old. Replacing them is easy. The arm is curved into a U-shape that holds the wiper blade. Pull the old one off and install the new one by slotting it over and under that U-shaped arm bend. These specific wipers have plastic protective covers over the mounting point. So unclip that cover, install and reseat the cover if that's the case for your new wipers as well. Then, finally work on the engine begins, sort of. Because we start with the intake filter. Often the intake filter box cover is held in place by screws, but here it just unclips. A quick replace and reclip, and this job is done. Now, let's get the car on jack stands, because of course the new intake filter is nice, but given that the car has been stationary for over a year, it's mostly the fuel and oil filters that are in dire need of replacement. By the way, the reason I needed some blocks to gain some clearance is that the front jacking point, the subframe, is quite far back. In the rear, the differential can be used to lift the car and get jack stands under the designated jacking points. Now, make sure that once the car is on jack stands, you give it a push on both sides, the front and the rear, to make sure that the car is stable. It's preferable to notice stability issues when you're not under the car, of course. Now that the car is up in the air, let's first change the oil and oil filter. 
I prefer undoing the plug by hand, but it was a bit stuck, so the impact on the low setting helped and now the oil can drain. After placing a new oil drain plug gasket, the plug can be received. Next up, the oil filter, which is surprisingly hard to reach, but luckily it wasn't previously installed by the Hulk himself, so at least it's fairly easy to undo. Then the new filter can be placed. I filled it with a bit of oil and used that same oil to lubricate the rubber seal before installing. I found that installing it can be done from the top as well. The advantage of a small engine in a comparatively large engine bay it makes everything a lot easier to reach. Then it's time to refill the oil. I use 10W40 because of the climate here and about 3.5 liters before it's full. If you do this in stages after the first 2.5 liters, leaving a 5 to 10 minute pass between adding oil, you can use the dipstick to see how close you are. When the dipstick reads full, run the car for a few minutes, check again and add the last bit of oil as needed. This concludes the oil change, now on to the spark plugs. Changing them is easy. First remove the coils using the old twist and pull method. After the coils are out, the spark plugs can be removed. I have a specialized socket that grabs the plug, but any deep socket will do. Although actually lifting the plug out might be a little bit finicky. The new spark plugs are pre-gapped at 1mm, but I'm checking to make sure anyway. As they are all correctly gapped, they can be installed, and I torque them down to the specified 20 Nm. Next, reseat the coil and put the wire back in its place. Now let's do number 2, 3 and 4. The oil that's on the third spark plug as well as on the fourth is worrying. I'm really hoping a valve cover gasket replace will prevent this. As the gasket hasn't been lifted yet though, I will install the plugs and replace the gasket in a later video. Now that's the last coil and this job is done. Next up, replacing the fuel filter. The fuel filter is located on the right hand side, just in front of the rear wheel, which should be taken off to make it work a lot easier. Of course the battery is still disconnected, but if it isn't, make sure that's done first. And there it is, behind a protective flap held in by clips that can be undone with a quarter ton of the screwdriver. Many clips are missing on my car, but they should be there on yours. Now, this is as good a time as any to say that this is not the perfect how-to. You'll see me spilling a fair amount of fuel later in this video, which could be partly prevented by relieving the fuel pressure. I linked a good how-to video in the description. On the other hand, it did all work out for me, so I'm not entirely sure I do it any differently the next time around. Now, the fuel filter is held in by a metal bracket that in turn mounts to the car. Removing this bracket makes life a lot easier. So let's undo the retaining bolts as well as the two mounting bolts and slide the bracket over the fuel filter to get it loose. Next, we'll loosely install the new fuel filter in the now freed up bracket. It should still be able to rotate. Prepping it this way makes remounting later a whole lot easier and a whole lot faster. Now the fuel lines for this facelift NB model are of the quick connect variety, which means you'll need one of these tools. By pushing it on the metal tube part of the fuel filter and then forcing it inside the fuel line connector, you should be able to undo the clip holding the line to the fuel. It's finicky and takes a surprising amount of work and force, but in the end it did pop off. And it immediately rained fuel on my sleeve, and luckily at least partly in the catch tray. Of course the fuel pump isn't on, so we're mostly dealing with gasoline that's in the filter, so we don't just keep going, but it still helps to be fast. Now, let's get the other hose loose, using that same tool and a surprising amount of force, and connect the new filter as well. A quick check of the old filter shows that there is an unsurprising amount of nastiness in grot, so I'm very glad we got it replaced. And now it's time to reinstall the filter. The proper place is easy to spot, given that it's the only part of the underside that's not dirty. Now, let's start the car to see if all is well. And as indicated by the lack of a gasoline rain, yes, the new filter works and is properly installed. So let's get the cover flap reseated and this job is done. Now the smart thing to do would be to fix the issue with the parking brake or emergency brake which doesn't engage properly. But I need some time away from the underside of this car so instead I focused on painting some random parts under the bonnet. Specifically the mounting brackets for the radiator and the hood strut. 
I wire wheeled these parts to a rust free state and used my professional painting boot which definitely is not built using a shuffle, the handle of a bucket and some painters tape to paint it. And I even have a second professional setup which again is not actually an upside down ladder. Anyway, let's get these parts remounted. I know this work doesn't really contribute to the larger goal of fixing this car, but hey, small projects count as well, right? Now, let's get that parking brake issue fixed. The first thing to check is if the handbrake cable balancer works properly. Somewhere in the middle of the underside of the car, next to the drive shaft, is this nifty contraption. As you can see, there's one cable that comes from the parking brake lever in the interior, which splits into two cables that go to the rear wheels. A warning, funnily enough they do cross positions, so the left side goes to the right side and the other way around. Now, let's pull that parking brake lever and we can see that the balance is alright, so this is not the issue. And a quick check shows that both sides are indeed balanced well, in that engaging the handbrake stops neither the left nor the right wheel from turning. Now, the mechanism that makes sure the brake engages is actually surprisingly simple. On the rear side of the caliper you'll find a bolt that can be taken off to reveal the position of an adjustment screw and this screw can be adjusted using an allen key. What you do is disengage the parking brake, so make sure that the lever is not pulled upward, and then tighten the adjustment screw until the wheel can't turn anymore. Now you find the point where the brake engages. Now back off a third of a turn. And that's it, you can now reseat the protective bolt on top of the adjustment screw and you're finished. Now I learned this method from a great YouTube channel called OG Petxing in his video called the ultimate Miata e-brake parking brake, brake adjustment guide. So find a link to that video in the description as it's a great detailed how to that is super helpful. And now that that is done let's get the wheel back on, get the car back onto the ground and make sure to properly torque the wheel. So that's it for this video. Uh, yeah got a lot done but obviously there's still a ton of stuff that should be done to this car to make it prettier, to make it drive better, to make it more comfortable. Uh, so I will cover that in many follow-up videos with many follow-up projects. If you want to follow along, make sure to like and subscribe and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.